Welcome to a special recording of the Sumer Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm one of the VPs at Sumer Sports. I'm joined by our Director of Communications, Sean Syed. Sean, uh, in addition to obviously, you know, writing for our website, you know, uh, you know, editing articles, all that kind of stuff, you are probably the best knower of football that we have uh, here at Sumer, um, maybe other than, you know, probably other than Thomas. Like, so, it's it's a it's very it's an awesome pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, about something that has been you know new to the NFL maybe five six years ago kind of well ingrained into offenses now to the point where I always like question their efficacy and th those are run pass options um, run pass options you know you could probably give a, a better definition than me but they they came on the scene in two thousand. You know, er, you know, mid mid last decade, and now they're they're you know firmly ingrained in offenses. Sean, um, when you think about RPOs, like what comes to your mind? What's your definition of, of this dynamic? Yeah, Eric, I think it's important to at least have some methodology for how are we going to categorize them. I think there's a lot of different ways to do it, but one way to do them is just binning them by pre snap RPOs and then post snap RPOs, and then within that you have more categories. So in the pre snap world, you think about Something like the Shanahan system uses their darts, which is basically just a one-step slant on the backside of a run call, where they're going to take advantage of that based on an advantageous look given to them by the defense. You, of course, have your kind of more old-school Brett Favre RPOs, where we have a run play called, and hey, that cornerback is 10 yards off. Let's just throw the ball out to a receiver in space and kind of get the offense rolling. And then that's kind of evolved to now what's more commonly known as access throws. I think some people call them kind of like gift RPOs, where basically that's just a yes or no for the quarterback. You know, say that cornerback's off at eight yards, we're going to run a five and out. We're going to get that ball out quick to our playmaker and get the offense rolling. Maybe that cornerback's pressed up and we like that matchup. It's going to convert into a fade, and that's a ball that we want to throw, even if it may be a low percentage kind of uh, example to go through. And then you can have just strictly numbers-based, whether it's, hey, the defense has two people over our, our trips. Let's throw that bubble. Let's try and take advantage. Or maybe it's one player over a stack with just two men, and you're trying to get the ball out there. So those are all the pre-snap world. Then you move to the post-snap world. I think it's important to understand, well, who is being read on the defense, right? You can cut it up by levels of the defense. You have a first-level RPO that's really reading the defensive line, usually a defensive end. That kind of gets into the more college-extended, more like modern triple option stuff. Then you have reading the second level. Those are the linebackers. Maybe you can include that kind of nickel apex defender in that, where the Eagles kind of got famous for that stretch looky play, where they're running stretch, have a slant behind that. That linebacker can't fill the space inside and cover the pass. Let's go ahead and get yards off that. And then now you have that third level RPO where if it's a safety rotating into the box, we're going to kind of run that glance. Maybe it's a four step slant, really whatever you want to call it, that in breaker behind that vacated space. And of course it gets more sophisticated in college, but I think it's important to at least at the start, understand that, Hey, we have pre-snap RPOs, we have post-snap RPOs, but then you have also have plays where it combines, you know, pre-snap RPO one way, post snap RPO the other way, of course, as well as with that run option there as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. So there's so many different variations of it, and they're obviously evolving to what teams are doing. One of the things that Tay, Seth, and I noticed when we did our, our tracking data study of linebackers is that linebackers have sensed, you know, even on just traditional play action stuff, but also against the run and, and against RPOs, have simply stopped moving as much. And so I think a lot of teams, like people I talk to in the league sometimes, are frustrated with their RPO game because they're it's sort of you're putting a linebacker at conflict and the linebacker is just making a gamble that ends up being such that the offense does worse than they would have if they just did a straight up run or a straight up pass. And that, that's kind of where I wanted to get to, because I think when I think of when I looked at the data on this, it was a very classic case of Simpsons paradox, right, where, you know, an RPO run if you just subset to runs has better EPA expected points added per play than a traditional run without an RPO tag. And I'm using pro football focuses tags here, and we can discuss kind of the data integrity there. Um, and then when you look at passing plays, passing plays with an RPO are more product, pr productive than passing plays without an RPO. However, if you combine all the plays, so you group them back together, plays with an RPO are less efficient than plays without an RPO. And that's even true after you adjust for things like down and distance, like all that stuff. And all this is to say the real reason, and one of the things that, you know, is systemic throughout the league is about 70% of RPOs that are charted by PFF end up being run plays. And so 
you know, it's the classic example of, yes, if you have to run the ball, an RPO is better. Yes, if you have to pass the ball, an RPO is better. But the very nature of going going through the process of, of running an RPO makes you run more or, or, or running more is a byproduct. But maybe it doesn't make you, but that's how the data ends up looking. And running the ball is less efficient than passing on balance. So you end up with this like Simpsons paradox. Now, that and actually in 2022, that Simpsons paradox went away because passing the football without an RPO actually became more efficient than passing the ball with an RPO in 2022. But the, the larger statement is true for more most of the last five or six years. And it's kind of concerning, I think, because it, it means that at least there's a fraction of teams who are running RPOs that are not doing them effectively. Yeah, and I do think it's important to consider that data issue. Um, I think that it's hard in any level of football to log. Well, okay, this is we're telling you that this play should be logged as X kind of play, whether it's an RPO, whatever. Obviously, some things are easier. I think that the tracking data does do a really good job, even with things that are really hard, like coverage. But we just do not know what is actually an RPO, right? Of course, we can always have a best guess. So I think that it requires just a step more, of, I think, critical thinking. I think going through the RPO cutups and seeing, well, you know, the quarterback's not reading anything. You know, there's nothing in this team's offense that says, hey, they have this pass attached to the run. It may be just something that they have kind of a fake bubble screen attached to it. So I think that right now there may be an overcounting issue. And I do think really, I think most solutions would probably create an undercounting issue. So I think that it, the thought that comes from that for me is you need to look within a team's offense and say, hey, does this RPO fit that offense, right? As mm -hmm. more teams run more comfortably from the gun, that's when RPOs get more effective because things are able to look the same, right? If you have a team that only gets into gun to run RPOs, I think the defense is probably more comfortable with that. And then even within that subset, there are just teams that I think they're smarter with how they do it. It may be that, you know, more quarterbacks that are coming up now, their offenses in, I mean, high school that I've seen, of course, then in college where, you know, they're running an RPO almost every play, right? So as that gets more comfortable with quarterbacks, I think we'll be able to see it. But it's still, to me, there is, I think, just a little bit of a data issue, at least when you are watching the clips that are tagged as RPOs, and I'm thinking, you know, hey, I, I just don't think it is, right? I think one example yeah. would be the Eagles' big, or sorry, the Dolphins' big play where they'll run that kind of seam flat wheel. And to me, you know, I think everything that's come out of Miami has said, well, that's, you know, that's just more of a play action play, right? So where they have this huge number, uh, it's kind of, I think the sample is a little bit biased that way because it seems like that they're telling us that it's a play action. And then you have the Eagles when they get into empty, right? They'll run stick to the three receiver side, and then Jalen Hurts will take a step back, step back. Kelsey will pull into space and they'll run quarterback draw behind that. And, you know, to me, that's just a run play, right? Everything I've heard about that, that is yeah. a run play. I think that gets logged as an RPO. So even when things look like an RPO, and then that gets to, I think, another point where does it only matter if the defense thinks an RPO, it's an RPO, and then a linebacker responds that way. But still, I just think, you know, I, I don't, I guess, disagree with the takeaways, but I think that, you know, the numbers are, uh, maybe not as perfect as we would want them to be. Yeah, I think I think when um, we do this this again, probably bring on a couple quarterbacks. I know like one of my friends, Sage Rosenfels, agrees with me because he's a big Shanahan, you know, decided he played for Shanahan in Houston and all that stuff. And yet like JT O'Sullivan, who's also very, very smart at quarterback play, when Sage and I did a podcast on the Iowa Everything show talking about RPOs, he was like, I don't agree with that at all. So there are two schools of thought. I do, you know, but I, I do think it's interesting because, you know, one, the last thing I want to ask you about is development, because, you know, I think that if you're trying to develop a quarterback for the NFL game, let's say you're a college coach or something like that, is, is RPO, is the RPOification of different levels of football, is that causing changes in how these quarterbacks come out of college? And, and if that is the case, is it, it like if that's the case, what are the implications moving forward? Yeah, I think that that's a really complicated question that starts with, well, what is a college football coach's job? Right. Do they see it as, hey, we need to get our players to the next level? Do they see it as, hey, we need to win games? But to me, you know, in football, things aren't always just good or bad. Right. It kind of it, of course, is going to have to come with context. And we're just we're going to see more RPOs likely because more RPOs are being run in college. Right? So I think that offenses in the pros that do a good job of adapting to their player skill set those play people are going to succeed more at the same time you got to understand well what does an rpo not that it replaces it but it's still going to be it really in your three-step passing game right just the way that the nfl rules are in college when you can have these these like really really complicated passing concepts attached to your rpo you just can't have that in the nfl 
So I think it's incumbent on teams with smart offensive coordinators. Like I love what the Giants did last year. I think that was a really interesting team to go through their RPOs where it seems like, hey, we're able to elevate Daniel Jones a little bit, get him into rhythm, just kind of cause the defense a little bit of a struggle through the, those RPOs. So I'm not sure if it would be, quote, good or bad for the game. I know I've had a lot of people, I feel like, reach out to me and say, you know, RPOs are ruining football. This is bad. This is bad. I do think it's awful for linebackers, right? Like, I feel like they're treated so unfairly across football, but the RPO makes it so difficult on them. So I think it has to be so specific to, does my quarterback understand the footwork? Does my quarterback have the ability to really snap their neck in kind of both ways where it looks so uncomfortable? Can they process things that quick? So it's just got to be so specific to the quarterback. And as more quarterbacks do that well in college, I think you're going to see that in the NFL. Of course, already has an increasing rate, I think, increasing rate. I think that'll probably be able to continue. But, you know, a quarterback still has to drop back, you know, take that, those five to seven steps and kind of deal that ball down the field. So it's just a part of their whole game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. A third down and 10, you're still going to have to be a drop back passer in both at whatever level of football you're in. I do get worried about quarterbacks who are playing in robo offenses where they don't face a ton of, you know, long yardage situations and all that stuff. But to your point, like they're still learning how to process. They're still learning how to, you know, they're still learning, you know, skills that'll be necessary to play in the NFL. Even if like, for example, with Tua Tagovailoa, the first two years when he was with Miami, even if it causes a difficult evaluation for people like me um, when, when we're trying to you know, play fantasy or, or ha handicap games and things like that. This has been a lot of fun. I just love, you know, talking football and kind of, you know, I think that sometimes us on the data side, we end up with a result and we think to ourselves, like, this kind of makes sense to me because, you know, how I've seen it reasoned is like, look, if, you know, for example, in an offensive lineman situation, they would just rather run block as opposed to having to worry about getting to the second level and getting called for a penalty. So maybe there's a little bit of timidness by them in RPO games. And then the quarterback situation where I think some quarterbacks prefer never to run any and some quarterbacks believe them to be an, an incredible edge for an offense. And it was cool for you to be able to tell me kind of that they're not the same. I think that. Uh, with the with the increase in tracking data technology and the increase in you know people like you working for companies like Sumer, I think we'll get closer to the solution of being able to tag them properly. But it is you know for a lot of teams it's just a bespoke thing where um, you know this is called an RPO versus this is not. But it can it can drastically change how you evaluate an offense. There's an article from last two years ago on PFF where I showed you know the Bills running game is terrible, but if you count their passes on RPOs as runs, like they're middle of the pack. And I think a lot of teams, you know, you just it's changed the way that we have to evaluate um, um, offenses. So um, for Sean Syed, this has been Eric Eager. This has been a mini Sumer Sports Show podcast about RPOs. Expect more of these on SumerSports.com in the future. Sean, thanks for coming. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Appreciate it, Eric.